morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, that's okay. I'll, I'll get to that. That's actually an important point that we need to talk about in the announcements. Um, good to see you all. And I'll get the COVID stuff out of the way, and then we'll continue on. So we're still doing social distancing. We could be doing this for another year or two. I hope not, but it happens. So just remember to keep your distance two meters apart. Even after the service, we're going to try to go outside because, as you know, the virus spreads. That's a harder time spreading outside. And we're still humming instead of singing. Hopefully that gets reversed at some point so we can sing while we wear masks. And kiddos, you're sticking through with me again. But we still have the kids feature, and I'm going to try to make it interesting for you. I'll try to make everything interesting for you. We'll see how that goes. Working on it. And, of course, I'll be dismissing you as after service as per usual. And as a conversation, if you missed it, um, church, we are going to continue meeting at 10 a.m. in coming, going into this new season in September because, well, we don't have Sunday school and there's really no reason to adjust it. So we're just going to stay there. And Sunday school is on hold until after the harvest, as well as the annual meeting and our elections. Um, still need a children's feature volunteers. I'm going to be doing it this Sunday. I'll be delighted to have a, a volunteer for next Sunday, so if you're interested, please let me know. Um, uh, just a reminder to keep in touch with um, our shut-ins and those who can't make it out through calling. And um, if you're a board member or a deacon, you just interested in doing that of your own accord. Um, uh, well, contact me, and I'll make sure that you have that you can do that, that we can continue to minister and show love to others. Okay, I think that about covers it. So if you have your Bibles with you, the scripture reading for this morning is 1 John chapter 5. We are going to be finishing up 1 John. <clears throat> Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child, right? By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have, this, have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God, does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, you will ask, and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not mortal. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who was born of God protects them and the evil one does not touch them. We know that we are God's children, and that the whole world lives under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, 
and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have a, a naughty passage before us this morning, and I pray for your spirit to be within me so that I may make it clear. Because there's a lot of, of important things for us to understand. In a time of doubt and confusion and uncertainty, we need to know who we are in relation to you. We need to know how we tell the difference between right and wrong, and where we can take a stand, and who we have put our hope in. So Lord, I pray that these things will come out this morning, and pray that you will speak to us. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. stand with us, and you can use your hands.
seated. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the offerings that still come in, the box in the back, and through the mail. Thanks that the lights are still on and that we are still meeting together. Thank you for how you preserved us and looked after us, Lord, in a world of financial uncertainty for many people. And Lord, we pray that you will show us if there is anything we can do to help those around us. Lord, help us to make a difference, we pray. So we pray that you will take this offering, and I pray that you will use it to bless your people, to bless this community, and bless your world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, kids, I've got some uh, questions for you. Have you ever been in a situation with your brother and sister where someone has done something wrong and you're about to get in trouble together? Ah, I see a smile. I think this must have happened before. Well, let's say, I don't know if people actually have vases anymore, but say there's like, your parents have a big vase and it falls over and it breaks. And your parents go and they sit both of you down and they ask, what happened? Now, tell me if this sounds familiar. Well, one sibling will say, she pushed it over. And the, the, boy, the guy will say, no, I didn't. She did. And the parent is faced with, with a challenge. Well, who do I believe? Who do I trust? How do I know what the truth is. You see, when, when someone is, is telling you what's going on, they are a witness. Does that make sense? A witness is someone who saw something happen, and then they tell someone else what happened. But you can have good witnesses, and you can have bad witnesses. People who are in trouble. But some t when two kids agree about what happened, and it's a pretty good indication that that thing actually happened. If both kids say, for instance, that yes, it was it was Nancy who pushed it over, and they both agree, and Nancy says yes, I pushed it over, then that's that's it's pretty likely that that's in fact what happened. Now, when we it comes to things like what the Bible tells us, the Bible is actually a collection of what witnesses have written down. So remember what a witness is? A witness is, who t is someone who tells other people about something that happened. So when we're talking about witnesses to who Jesus is and what he did, that's what we find in the Bible. But how do we know that the witnesses in the Bible are true? How do we know that they are telling us the truth? Well, there are many ways for us to know, but another way for us to know that someone is telling the truth is that there are other witnesses. And there are, in fact, other witnesses outside the Bible. Are you tracking with me? Kind of? Well, there was this, um, this Roman guy, was it Pliny or Trajan? I forget who was writing letters to whom. But a long time ago, just a few hundred years ago, after, after the time of Jesus, there was a guy, I think it was Pliny writing to Trajan, but I could be wrong about that. You'll have to check it on Wikipedia if you're tuning in, as I get the two mixed up. But one of them is writing letters to the other. You see, I left all that information on my camera, which is doing the live stream, so it'll have it in front of me. You know, you should think of these things, but then you don't. He's writing these letters, and he says to Trajan, well, there's these weird people called Christians. And so I, I tortured some of them, and I killed some of them, but I'm not really sure what I should do. Do you have any advice? You see, he wasn't the nicest guy. But he was writing for information, and he said, you know, according to these witnesses, what all that they would do was they would meet in the mornings, and they would worship Jesus as like he was a god. So we have a witness in someone who does not like Christians about what Christians actually believed. So even then, they, they knew, everybody knew, that Christians believed that Jesus was the Son of God. 
So it's another witness. So you, you have a witness, because the Bible is a witness that, yes, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we have another witness outside of that that says, yes, these Christians actually believe that Jesus was the Son of God. It wasn't just something invented later. Anyways, I hope that wasn't too convoluted for you. But remember, next time when you have a story with your siblings, and someone says one thing, or some, someone says another thing, and someone says, and they both say it together, you're going to have a better chance of being believed if you say the same thing, for starters. And you can be reminded that we have many witnesses about who Jesus is and what he did. Make sense? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have left us many witnesses to who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Lord, we're thankful that our faith is not a blind faith, that you have given us evidence as to who you are and who your son is and what you have done for us. We can have confidence in our faith. And Lord, we are thankful for this. Please watch over these kids, Lord, as they learn and as they grow, as they encounter other people who question their beliefs, Lord. I pray that they will be able to find strength and security in your word and the other testimony that you have left to yourself. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn once again to 1 John 5, because that's what we we're working for. So I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I was reading over my sermon last night. And <laughs> that's never happened to me. Never happened to me ever. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Oh, it's... Yeah, so what I was saying anyway, I was reading it over my sermon, and I didn't like it. I thought that it was too convoluted, and that my sentences were too long, and that people wouldn't really be tracking me. So I'm going to stick with some of it, but other parts I'm going to improvise, so I could use your prayers for me this morning. <laughs> and if it goes horribly wrong, well, I just won't do it ever again. So to begin with, have any of you ever experienced vertigo? Some of you, oh yeah, and someone who isn't here. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, vertigo is the experience, if you've never had it, that you don't know where up and down is, and you don't know where left and right is, and the room seems to be moving, but it's not really, and your head seems to be moving, but you're not moving it. It's very disconcerting. Now, we live in a time of moral vertigo. What do I mean by this? Well, it seems like the bar of where right and wrong are, you know, it's, it's constantly moving, right? Because, you know, a few generations ago, this might have been completely, opinion might have been completely acceptable, but now it's not acceptable, and we don't know what's going to be acceptable in the future. It seems that we have a lot of special interest groups that fight among themselves for their various causes. And now we also have, we see, Heroes of past gen generations unceremoniously toppled from their pedestals, sometimes quite literally. And now, then they're replaced with others that better reflect our society's current values. And sometimes this is a good thing. I don't know if we need any statues of Stalin or, or Mao or, or Hitler hanging around. Right? Sometimes if we, we pull down statues because we need to repudiate past wrongs and we need to set things to rights. But sometimes when we, we can, that can be damaging. And the interests of these special groups ends up causing, in fact, more pain and suffering. But the problem is, how are we going to tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong if, if the bar is constantly moving? How do we find a stable place to stand where we can say, this is what is right, and this is what is true, and this is what is not. We live in an age of doubt and uncertainty. And it's not surprising, then, 
that we can sometimes feel insecure and frightened. It's difficult to talk about Jesus with other people when we are in a world that's constantly calling our faith into question on all fronts. Whenever you pick up a magazine, whenever you turn on the TV or browse a page on the internet. So in his first letter, John tells us about who God is and who we are and the enemy that we face. He reminds us of the basis we have for our faith and the difference it will make in our lives when it's present. And so in the reading for today, we have John interweaving a lot of things together. He's packed it pretty densely. It's kind of like when uh, Liella braids my daughter's hair. She takes all these strands. I'm, I still need to learn how to do this because I don't. And she separates them and she kind of weaves them all together in, into this little beautiful little knot. But we need to we need to pull apart these strands and see if we can we can understand them. Sometimes we need to just slow down. So it says that John opens by saying, chapter five by saying, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So if we believe in who Jesus is, then we are, we, we are born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. You know, if you love me, you better love my kids. That's kind of how, how God says things are supposed to be. So if we say we're going to love God, we have to love one another. You cannot get away with uh, being a Christian all by yourself, shut aside from the rest of the church and outside. That's not the way it works. If you belong to Jesus, you have to love God's people. Not optional. And that we love God by obeying his commands. And John says that his commands are not burdensome, for whoever is born of God conquers the world. So when you know that you are going to win, when you know that you are going to conquer, that the troubles that you're going through and the trials that you're facing are not quite as burdensome. They're not quite as troublesome. But what does it mean to conquer the world. Well, sometimes, if you look on Facebook and you see some Christians and what they post, it seems like conquering the world involves getting this politician in the place of power, or pulling this politician down because we need to get rid of him because he's doing nasty things. Now, it is true that we should be involved in the world around us. We Christians should be involved in politics. But that's not where our ultimate hope lies. Our hope has to be in Jesus Christ. We don't conquer the world by, like, by force, by imposing our views on everyone else and making everyone cry uncle. In fact, truth be told, Christians don't, have a, don't exactly have a good record when it comes to being in power. If you look at what you know, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, and even some Protestant churches after the Reformation did, you know, burning people at the stake and doing nasty things, sometimes, and a lot of the times, Christians have abused their power. What John is talking about here by overcoming the world is not by playing, not is not playing by the world's rules. In other words, we don't live for the things that the world around us lives for. We don't live just to eat, drink, and be merry, to make the most money and to have the most toys before we die. That's not how we are supposed to live. We don't live for political causes, hoping that you know by changing the system and, and this, we're gonna make everything right. Because we believe that change has to start right here. It's not gonna work all the changes in the world, it might make the, help to make the world better, I'm not saying we shouldn't involve, but for deep change inside of us, it has to be God through the power of the Spirit working in our hearts and in our lives. That is where true change has to start. That's where our hope is. Our hope is in the coming kingdom of God. Our hope is not in any political party or any political figure. That's what John means by conquering the world. How did Jesus conquer the world? He didn't come at the, at the head of an army riding on a white charger. No, he died on a cross. And in that way, he conquered the world. He didn't live 
according to the world's rules. And he conquered because God raised him from the dead. And we also have to look at that and say, in our lives, conquering the world is, might not look pretty. It might not be comfortable. But it is what God has called us to do. And in the end, God will triumph, and he will set things to rights. Now let's move down to verse 6, if you have your Bibles with you. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not water only, but with the water and the blood. Now, to be perfectly honest, this is a John's letter from a long time ago, and we're not exactly sure what he means. So take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But according to the commentators that I've read, the water and the blood refer to Jesus' life and ministry. The water is when he was baptized by John. That's at the beginning. Remember when the dove comes down and then there's a voice of God saying, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. That's the beginning. And the blood, well, that's the cross. The water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies for the Spirit is true. So these are the three that agree. Jesus' ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 9, if we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. This is an argument, type of argument that Jesus often uses in his ministry. It's called a fortiori. I might have had the pronunciation wrong on that. It's from Latin, and I'm not brilliant. I don't know Latin. So I'm working on that, but I don't know it yet. So a fortiori means from the stronger. In other words, if, we, if I accept you know, what my daughter says about something, and it's the truth, and how much more should I believe my wife when she tells me something? and I believe it to be the truth, right? It's about, it's about sources, and it's about you know, what, what you believe. Well, if you, you believe these things, and it comes from this source, which is you know, just normal, well, this is God we're talking about, so we better trust him and believe what the source is. And the testimony that God gives is the life of his son and the power of his spirit. And as I was saying to the, the kids earlier, this is, this is the grounds for what we believe. This is why we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. In verse 12, this is very unpopular in many circles. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the most offensive part of our faith, perhaps, in this day and age. To say that you need Jesus Christ in order to be right with God. Now, as to the, the fate of those who, who have never heard of Jesus, that's not something the Bible really tells us a lot about. I mean, there's passages in Acts 17 where it talks about God kind of overlooking the things that people did in, in ages past out of ignorance, but now Paul says that he calls everyone to repentance. So whatever happens, that's between them and God, and God is just, and God is right, and he will do the right thing. But we still have a responsibility to tell others about Jesus, because they need him. You need to remember that. People need the Lord. You cannot do well in this life without Jesus. Each and every one of us need him. And the community around us needs Jesus. They might think they don't, but really, they are lost without him. They are missing out on the most important thing in life. Not something I need to remind myself. Not something I'm reminding you of this morning. Verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. How do we know that we belong to Jesus? Well, in other passages, John has talked about the things that we do. If we belong to Jesus, we will act in certain ways. The evidence of belonging to Jesus will appear in our lives. We will be loving. We will be gentle, kind, patient, and compassionate. And we believe in who Jesus is. And all those things are tied together. Who Jesus is, how we act, and who we are. 
Now, verse 14, this is, a little, this is a little trickier. And this is a boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, and that bit right there is very important, according to his will. Because we can ask things according to our own will. We can ask things because this is what we want. This is what we want for this other person. This is what we want for ourselves. And that's not how we are supposed to pray. That's not how Jesus prayed in the garden. He said, Jesus said, this is what I would like. I would like this cup to pass from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. That's the model we have to follow. And if we ask according to his will, he hears us. God does hear us when we ask. And we know we have obtained the requests made of him. This is trouble, difficult, because sometimes we, we think we are asking according to his will. When we ask for someone to be healed, when we ask for God to show someone the truth so that they might accept him and then they might follow Jesus or come back to faith in him. And isn't that part of God's will? And you know what? I don't have that all sorted out, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you, you can try to ram it through. You can try to be dogmatic about it, but some things we don't know. We don't know why God allows some things, why he allows some things, and why he doesn't allow others. But God does hear us, and it is worthwhile asking. Now we have a tricky passage here about when you see a brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, you will ask and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not mortal. But John then says we're not supposed to pray about a mortal sin. Well, what on earth does that mean? Well, in certain faith traditions, people say, well, there's some things that are really bad and something like murder. And remember earlier on in the book of 1 John, it says that we know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Yeah, I don't think that's what John is getting here. After all, if you look in the Bible, uh, King David himself was a murderer and an adulterer. And yet I, I think we'll still see him in the new heaven and the new earth. Right? So it's not about, about the, our slips, up, slips, our falls, or the sins we fall into. I think it's more the defiant type. Remember earlier on in 1 John when Paul talks about the Antichrists, those who deny who Jesus is, and by with their lips and by how they act. If you consistently act in a way that is contrary to God's will, if you deny Jesus Christ, you're in trouble. That's, that's what a mortal sin is. If you deny Jesus, if you walk away from him, and if you live a life that denies him, that's trouble. And it seems chilling that John says that we should pray about those things. And that, I guess there's parts of scripture that disturb me. And I, I don't want to. John says that, we, it's, that he doesn't forbid us from praying, but he says at a certain point, you let that person go. That's what it says. You don't have to like it. I don't have to like it, but that's what the text says. But the good thing is, is that if we see someone who is caught up in a sin, someone who is in trouble, they slip, they've fallen, that we can pray for them and that God will restore from them. So take comfort in that. Now we've got to the end. And I haven't looked at my sermon. Uh, well, the, I looked at the opening part, I didn't look at the end part, so I'm still working on this. We know, there are three we knows from verse 18 to verses 20. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who is born of God protects them, and the evil one does not touch them. So again, John is speaking in, in blanket terms. When he's saying does not sin, it means does not, he's not saying that, well, you don't sin ever. Otherwise, we're all toast. I mean, let's, let's close the church down and just eat and drink and be merry, because we're... None of us are going to get, get by. No, it's about living a life of consistent sin. That's, that's what we don't do if we belong to God. But the one who is born of God protects them. Now, John is not talking about us, though he says we are born of God. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one who protects us, and the evil one does not touch them. So remember that. 
that Jesus will protect you, and that Satan, although he is real, can't touch you. You belong to Jesus. And that's something to take comfort from. And we know that we are God's children, and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So we belong to God, but this world right now that we see, and we, on the news and through the internet, God's kingdom has not yet fully come. His will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. Our world lies under the power of the evil one, and that's something that we have to be aware of. That's something we have to... And when we pray, every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray that God will come and that Satan will be finally turned. I mean, his faith sealed. Jesus broke his power on the cross. But the end game still needs to be played out. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So John is just affirming here that Jesus has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know who God is. If we want to know who God is, we look at Jesus. And then the last verse. It seems almost out of place. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's, it's John's kind of last word here. And idols, as you know, are anything that distracts us, anything that gets in the way of following Jesus. And all of us need to be on the lookout for that. Okay, I've crashed through uh, 1 John chapter 5. Hope you didn't mind me improvising a little bit. I hope that was a little better than the sermon I had written. Oh my, the sentences were so long, it was convoluted, and it was, just wasn't working for me. <laughs> So anyway, but all this, I don't. I want to do it justice because there is so much that's important to here. Going back to our earlier questions, like how do we know what is right and wrong? How do we know where we stand? If we know that we belong to Jesus, well, that's that gives us a place to stand in a world that's uncertain. That's just it's full of vertigo. It's spinning. It's sliding. We don't know left from right, right from wrong. Stick with Jesus and stick with his people. Remember, you got to love them, you got to be with them. Not optional. Love God, love his people, stay away from idols. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth it contains. Lord, I want everyone here to know that they have eternal life that they belong to you, that they follow you. And Lord, help us to love one another, to stick together, because we are not going to survive these hard times, these crazy times, these uncertain times, if we don't belong to you and we don't belong to one another. Lord, help us to stay rooted in who you are and who Jesus is. And help us to live it up. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I can ask you to stand with us again. See if you can, uh, well, you can try clapping. See how it goes.
serve the Lord.